Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, FY 2024, Enhancing Correctional Practices to Protect Vulnerable People, Technical Assistance and Microgrant Program, hosted by the Bureau of Justice Assistance. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Thomas Talbot, Senior Policy Advisor with BJ, to begin the presentation. Tom? Thanks so much, uh, Daryl, and Daryl, thanks to you for all your support and assistance in um, setting up this webinar and facilitating it today. Um, I see there are 33 attendees from across the country already. Thank you all so much for being here uh, to listen to and participate in a conversation about this exciting new B uh, BJA program. Um, I'm joined today um, by my wonderful colleague, Dee Holly, a policy advisor in BJA's uh, Korea Management Office, and I'll just turn the baton over to her briefly to say hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm Dee Holly, and you'll notice that on the screen I'm Deborah, which is the legal name that I go by Dee, so, um, and I'm a policy advisor with Tom in the Korea Management Office. Welcome. Thanks so much, Dee, and so we're going to um, um, not hesitate and dive right into the materials here, starting with the agenda, and so that you all out there across the country can focus on the slides and the material. I'm going to um, go off video and walk you through the first chunk of the material today, and then I'll pass the baton to Dee shortly. So again, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, in terms of our agenda today, uh, Dee and I are going to do a brief introduction uh, to DOJ's Office of Justice programs and its components, including uh, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, where Dee and I uh, work within the PREA Management Office. We'll also provide a fairly high-level overview of this exciting new BJA program. We'll discuss the eligibility criteria related to it and run through the application requirements. And we'll highlight some key application resources that we want to be sure you all are aware of and understand. And then at the end, um, as Daryl mentioned, there'll be an opportunity for Q&A. So as Dee and I go through the slides, please jot down any questions that you have, and we will be sure to address those at the end. We anticipate that we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of these and my prepared uh, remarks. Next slide, please, Daryl. Thanks. Um, so that you all are on the same page about where exactly this new program is coming from within the Department of Justice, we want to begin by talking about DOJ's Office of Justice programs and its components, including the Bureau of Justice Assistance, or BJA. Next slide. Um, the Office of Justice programs, as you may know, provides grant funding, training, technical assistance, research, and in statistical analysis to benefit and support the criminal and juvenile justice systems related to um, efforts um, specifically at the state, local, and tribal level across the country. OJP is the largest grant-making component within DOJ, and in addition to OJP, the two other grant-making components are the Office on Violence Against Women and the Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services. OJP's grant-making research and statistical analysis work is spread across six program offices that are on the slide. The Bureau of Justice Assistance, again, where DNI work, is the largest of the OJP components, which also includes the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which is the, the statistical analysis arm of OJP and DOJ, the National Institute of Justice, which is the research arm of OJP and DOJ, the Office for Victims of Crime, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, and the Office of Sex Offender Sentencing, Monitoring, Apprehending, Registering, and Tracking. Again, the work of all six of these OJP program offices focuses primarily on supporting the criminal and juvenile justice work of state, local, and tribal agencies across the country. Next slide, please. And the Bureau of Justice Assistance, or BJA, was created back in 1984 to reduce violent crime, create safer communities, and reform our nation's criminal justice system. And BJA strengthens the nation's uh, criminal justice system and helps America's state, local, and tribal jurisdictions uh, to prevent crime, reduce re recidivism, and promote a, a fair and safe criminal justice system. Uh, BJA focuses its programmatic and policy efforts on providing a very wide range of resources, including training and technical assistance uh, to law enforcement, the courts, corrections agencies, the treatment community, those involved in reentry, and an array of criminal uh, community-based partners to address chronic and emerging criminal justice challenges nationwide. 
Uh, Carlton Moore is BJA's director, and I'm very grateful for his leadership and the leadership of OJP's Assistant Attorney General, Amy Solomon. I know that Director Moore and AAG Solomon are very excited about the new program focusing on protecting vulnerable people in confinement settings that we're discussing today. For those of you who closely track funding opportunities that BJA makes available, you may have noticed that this solicitation is being made available for an extended period of time to ensure that all potential applicants have an opportunity to put together high quality, thoughtful, and comprehensive responses to the solicitation. Next slide, please. This new vulnerable populations program really reflects how BJA continues to provide support to the criminal justice field. As we'll discuss during this webinar, this new program is investing in a competitive cooperative agreement, and the organization that's selected will make funding available to the field in the form of competitive microgrants. In addition, the, the cooperative agreement recipient will provide training and technical assistance to support the microgrant recipients and other uh, diverse agencies across the country to enhance their efforts to protect vulnerable people behind the walls. In addition, this program will focus on sharing knowledge about promising and innovative practices to protect, uh, to, pr to, to protect excuse me, vulnerable people. And we expect this sharing to occur between and among the selected cooperative agreement recipient, the agencies that are selected to receive micro grants, the larger field, and BJA. And as BJA Director Moore continually emphasizes, a key role that BJA plays and a key theme of this program is engagement. The work to be done under this program to enhance the safety of vulnerable people in confinement settings relies on meaningful engagement in the development of positive working relationships uh, between and among the selected cooperative agreement recipient, the agencies that are identified to receive micro grants, the larger field, and BJA. Next slide, please. So now we're going to dive in and talk a little bit about this exciting new program. We want to emphasize um, that all of the information that DNI provide today is available in the solicitation and in the other resources that are referenced in the solicitation, such as the DOJ Grants Financial Guide. Um, so next slide, please, Daryl. As stated clearly in the solicitation, BJA anticipates making one competitive award under this program, as I mentioned, in the form of a cooperative agreement in the amount of $2.5 million. The duration of this award this award will be 48 months, and as described in the solicitation on page 9, under the subheading entitled Continuation Funding Intent, OJP and BJA may, in certain cases, provide additional funding in future years to awards made under this funding opportunity through continuation awards. OJP will consider, among other factors, OJP's strategic priorities, a recipient's overall management of the award, and the progress of the work funded under the award when making continuation award decisions. So practically speaking, what this means from my point of view is that assuming protecting vulnerable people in confinement settings remains a high priority for BJA, OJP, and DOJ, and assuming the selected cooperative agreement recipient meets or exceeds BJA's expectations as defined in the solicitation, supplemental funding is definitely um, a possibility in future fiscal years. In order to maximize the important opportunity this program provides to BJA and to the field to invest in innovative and promising strategies that keep vulnerable people who are confined safe and to provide targeted training and technical assistance to those agencies in receipt of microgrants into the field at large. So next slide, please. Now, in terms of program goals, this new program has three primary uh, ones, which are first, um, to support state, local, and tribal agencies to protect vulnerable people um, in their confinement facilities and to reduce the use of overly punitive or restrictive measures to keep them safe. BJ remains interested in reducing the use of restrictive housing and segregation overall and as a method or strategy to keep vulnerable populations safe from abuse. As I've already mentioned, a key component of this program is the selection and administration of microgrants to state, local, and tribal agencies. And BJ anticipates that each microgram will not exceed $50,000. Some of you may be aware that the PREA statute includes a provision that requires a 50% match for state, local, and tribal agencies in receipt of PREA funding. 
this match requirement does apply to the microgrants to be supported under this program. However, DNI double checked with OGP's Office of General Counsel and the FY24 Appropriations Act, under which OJP and BJA are now operating, allows this match requirement to be waived for microgrant recipients if the agency has a demonstrable fiscal hardship that makes it difficult for them to comply with the match requirement. I should also clarify that for cooperative agreement recipients that are applying for this funding, the full $2.5 million, there is no match requirement. Um, so be aware of that. So the match requirement only applies to the micro grants to be awarded and administered under this program. So given what we know about the tight budgets and fiscal constraints in state, local, and tribal criminal justice agencies, we at BJA anticipate working with the selected cooperative agreement um, recipient to accommodate match waiver requests from the agencies selected uh, to again receive those micro grants. And put another way, we at BJA do not want fiscal hardships and challenges related to the match requirement to get in the way of a given agency's efforts to enhance the safety of vulnerable people in their facilities. And then moving on to um, goal number three, a key part of this program is to deliver training and technical assistance to the agencies in receipt of micro grants and to the field at large. Of course, the TTA to be provided to the selected micro grants is a high priority and will likely be more time and labor intensive than the TTA to be provided to the larger field. But nonetheless, uh, BJA, we at BJA also envision that this program will be able to respond to and, and address at least to a degree of the TTA needs of the larger field. Next slide. In regards to the target population for this exciting new program, BJA has deliberately and intentionally included a fairly broad definition of vulnerable people in the solicitation. Um, as stated in the solicitation, under this program, vulnerable people include, uh, but are not limited to, those with one or more physical disability, severe or persistent mental illness, or who are LGBTQ+, youth who are confined in adult facilities, blind, deaf, or non-English speaking. Uh, BJA included the not limited to language because we recognize that there are other types of vulnerable people that applicants may want to focus on. In addition, I want to note that this program focuses on adult confinement facilities specifically. Uh, given resource limitations and the fact that BJA's partners at the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention fund and support work in juvenile confinement facilities, the work under this program will include adult confinement facilities only. Of course, we recognize that youth may be confined in adult facilities, and these youth are, for a host of reasons, vulnerable in these settings, which is why we included them in our broad definition of vulnerable people. Next slide. You all may be aware that OJP and BJA continue to work to enable diverse state, local, and tribal agencies to access federal funding in a number of different ways. And we continue to make um, use of micro grants as one important strategy to do this. For more information about the micro grants to be funded under this program, Dean, I encourage you to review the solicitation and reference information about micro grants, also referred to as sub awards, in the DOJ grants financial guide. As I stated, this is the successful applicant under this program will enter into a cooperative agreement with BJA. And this cooperative agreement recipient will then, in coordination and partnership with BJA, select and administer subawards or pass through funding to agencies that are operating confinement facilities uh, to carry out parts of this federal award. As I mentioned, we do not anticipate that these micro grants or subawards will exceed $50,000 each. And as I will emphasize in a minute, at least 50% of the total or overall award, or $1.25 million, $1,250,000, must be used for and awarded as microgrants. The agencies selected to receive microgrants or subawards must adhere to any applicable laws in their jurisdiction um, and to the rules defined in the DOJ Grants Financial Guide. In consultation with BJA, the selected cooperative agreement holder can impose additional financial um, and administrative requirements on the subawards or microgrants that go beyond what the DOJ grants financial guide requires. 
And as I emphasized already, eligible microgrant or subaward recipients are state, local, and tribal agencies working to protect vulnerable people in their confinement facilities. Next slide, please. I want to briefly highlight here the specific program objectives under this new initiative. They're consistent with the information I've already uh, discussed, such as the program goals, and include developing a microgrant program, marketing the availability of microgrants, receiving and reviewing applications to receive microgrants from state, local, and tribal agencies, and administering those microgrants. In addition, providing training and technical assistance to those agencies in receipt of microgrants providing TTA in response to requests from other confinement facilities and agencies, and developing and delivering targeted cost-effective training and other resources to the field. And Dee will talk about specific deliverables under this program in a few minutes, including what this targeted cost-effective high-quality training and other resources are and look like. Next slide. I mentioned this already, but I want to emphasize and underscore again that at least 50% of this total cooperative agreement award must be used for and awarded as micro grants. The total award, again, is $2.5 million, and 50% of this is $1,250,000. So $1.25 million of the total $2.5 million award must be used for and awarded as micro grants. And given BJA's strong interest in stretching the available funding as far as possible and supporting more as opposed to fewer agencies in their efforts to protect those who are vulnerable behind the walls, we anticipate that each micro grant will not exceed $50,000. Next slide. I also want to draw your attention to the two broader program priorities that are included in this solicitation and in most other BJA solicitations in fiscal year 2024. These priorities are described in detail on pages eight and nine of the solicitation, and they reflect larger, very important priorities of DOJ in the current administration. So under this program, BJA and OJP will provide priority consideration to applications that propose projects that are designed to meaningfully advance equity and remove barriers to access to services and opportunities for communities that have been historically underserved, marginalized, adversely affected by inequality, and disproportionately impacted by crime, violence, and victimization. In addition, priority consideration will be given to applicants that demonstrate that their capabilities and competencies uh, for implementing their proposed projects are enhanced because they, or at least one proposed partner or subrecipient that will receive at least 40% of the requested award or funding, are a population-specific organization that serves communities that have been historically underserved, marginalized, adversely affected by inequality, and disproportionately impacted by crime, violence, and victimization. Once again, for more, import, for more information about these very important program priorities, please, please see pages eight and nine of the solicitation. Next slide, please. On this slide and the following one, we've included a few examples of the kinds of innovations that can or may be funded under this new program via microgrants. Dee and I want to emphasize that the examples here in the slides and in the solicitation on pages six and seven are intended to be illustrative of the kinds of work that may be supported and funded via microgrants. They are definitely not requirements. So examples include promoting positive changes in the cultures in agencies and confinement facilities that prioritize the safety of vulnerable people and that reflect a zero tolerance for abuse. Improving the intake screening and assessment process using validated research-supported tools to identify individuals who are at higher risk of being victimized and those who are more likely to victimize others, and increasing the use of this screening and assessment information to guide housing and programming placements and other decisions behind the walls that enhance the safety of those who are vulnerable. Next slide, please, Daryl. In addition, and as I already already mentioned briefly, another area of focus under this program is reducing the use of restrictive housing or segregation to protect vulnerable people and then creating viable, less restrictive and less punitive alternatives to house 
um, those who are vulnerable. Micro grants may also be used on partnering with external victim advocates and service providers to support survivors of, of, of abuse in confinement settings. And in addition, micro grants may create or expand ways for people who are victimized behind the walls to confidentially or anonymously report incidents of abuse and to educate them about these reporting options so that they are more likely to make use of them. Again, I want to emphasize that these innovations um, here on the slide and the others included in the solicitation are simply examples of the kinds of things that may be funded using the micro grants under this new program. They're not requirements, and we strongly encourage applicants to think about and include in their submissions additional examples of innovations that they would like to support to keep vulnerable people who are confined safe from abuse and harassment. With that, I'm going to uh, pass the baton to my wonderful colleague, Dee Hawley, um, who will talk about el eligibility considerations and application requirements under this new program. Thanks, Dee. Uh, take it away. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Thanks, Tom, and good afternoon again. Um, in this section, we'll talk a little bit about uh, who's eligible. That's up on the next slide, you'll see. And we're also going to talk about application requirements, um, or as I like to call them, component parts of your application. As you can see on the slide, uh, eligible applicants include public and state controlled institutions of higher education, nonprofits having a 5013C3 status with the IRS, other, other than institutions of higher education, nonprofits that do not have a 501C3 status with the IRS, other than institutions of higher education, private institutions of higher education, for-profit organizations other than small businesses and small businesses. Next slide. Applicants must be able to demonstrate in their applications the ability and the capacity to manage a microgrant program. That may sound relatively simple, but there's a lot behind the word administer. The applicant will need to show that they can stand up, that is, design a program from start to finish. I think many training and technical assistance providers are more accustomed to large grants that fund projects with broad and sweeping goals. But in this case, the applicant will be working with numerous sub-recipient sub grantees who are working to achieve goals and objectives that are narrower and often less complex. In consultation with BJA, standing up the program will entail developing information and announcements, designing a marketing strategy, developing a competitive but relatively simple application process, and ensuring an equitable selection process. Uh, some microgrant recipients may be used to managing and implementing grants. However, some may not be as adept at grant administration, reporting, and organizing grant activities. It will be important for the applicant to be able to guide selected, so, selected sub-recipients as they develop and refine their goals, objectives, and project activities that are achievable and aligned with those in the solicitation. In addition, they may need to provide guidance on financial and administrative requirements laid out in the DOJ Grants Financial Guide, as well as other requirements uh, the provider may need to impose uh, needed to ensure subrecipient grants are successfully administered. In terms of experience, it would be great for the applicant provider to have some experience with or access to people with direct experience developing, implementing, assessing, and revising policies and practices to reduce victimization and the overuse of restrict, overly restrictive and punitive methods as a way of reaching this overall goal. This may include practices towards, toward moving vulnerable populations into less restrictive housing areas where they can participate in more general activities available to everyone but with continuous monitoring to ensure they are not victimized. Providing training and technical assistance on a national scale is something often seen in solicitations. But again, looking behind the curtain, what does this mean? It will mean establishing an efficient but applicant-centered method to receive and triage requests and develop a targeted and appropriate response to requests for training and tech technical assistance. Applicants should have the capacity to communicate with individuals from a range of facility sizes and types, large and small, urban and rural, as well as communicate with individuals from various levels within an agency to help them craft and refine their assistance requests. Next slide, please. In addition to administering microgrants, um, 
the qualities and in, in addition, I'm sorry, in um, the addition to the qualities and topics just mentioned, the critical component of microgrant administration is to ensure that funding recipients or subrecipients stay within the guardrails of the sub recipient monitoring guidance in the DOJ grants financial guide. Generally, this will mean ensuring that grant funds are used as, for authorized purposes and follow federal law and re regulations. Plus any terms and requirements included in their subrecipient agreements and are written into those agreements to achieve help the subrecipients achieve their outlined goals. Applicants should review the discussion on subrecipient monitoring in the DOJ grants financial guide on page 102 of that guide. Next slide. The application requirements are again, as I like to call them, have four component parts. These include the project, the proposal abstract, the proposal narrative, a budget worksheet and a budget narrative, and the SF-424 forms. The budget documents and the 424 standard forms are on web-based and mostly self-explanatory. However, if you do have issues filling these out, there are resources available to help you navigate these waters. We have a slide at the end of the presentation, which Tom will go over, with email addresses and yay, yay, hotline numbers to assist you as needed. This information is also, of course, included in the solicitation. Next slide. The project abstract um, is, um, should contain a summary of the purpose of the project, the, ex the expected outcomes, and the intended beneficiaries. Since this will be a publicly available document, it should be written in the third person. In addition, the description contains the description in the solicitation will give you um, specific instructions regarding the length of the, of the abstract or and the, uh, the length of the abstract, the composition, including a word count and formal uh, format instructions. Next slide. Uh, this is the, uh, the pro proposal narrative is really sort of the heart of the application. The slide shows you uh, the component parts of that narrative a description of the issue, the applicant's project and design implementation plan, a description of the applicant's capabilities and competencies, a plan for collecting the required data on performance measures, and a timeline to achieve the goals, objectives, and deliverables. In describing the issue, the section should generally include uh, why the proposed activities are necessary and how they will address a need, as well as the size and scope of the problem and the effects it has on vulnerable populations and confinement. As noted on the slide, the applicant's project design should convey first the applicant's strategy to address the needs or problems in protecting vulnerable populations. Second, the applicant's approach to select and administer microgrants. And third, develop and deliver training and technical assistance to the microgrant recipients, as well as the field at large. Applicants sometimes describe their capabilities and competencies in general terms and relate them to past projects. While this is helpful, and certainly nothing wrong with it, to reviewers, it is also important to, uh, to point out how those uh, competencies and ca um, capabilities will support the work of accomplishing the goals, objectives, and um, ultimately protect vulnerable populations. The solicitation also details what is expected in terms of data collection and reporting, plus the, OJ, plus the OJP for performance measurement page provides, an additional, provides additional guidance. The link to this page is on page 27 of the solicitation. Like the budget materials, the timeline is completed on, as a web-based form. Because the solicitation has over, established the overall goal and key objectives enabled to enable reaching this goal, connecting points on the timeline to goal or goals to object and to objectives can present the reviewers with an integrated picture of your overall project. Next slide. The applicant's component parts just discussed should be designed and written to result in the clearly articulated deliverables listed in the solicitation. You'll see on this slide um, that on these Excuse me, you'll see these on the slide and include a comprehensive competitive process to make microgrants and training and technical assistance available to state, local, and tribal confinement agencies and facilities, provision of training and technical assistance to the selected microgrant recipients, 
a process to market and deliver training and technical assistance to those who do not receive microgrants, online virtual webinars, in-person training and workshops at national conferences, and a practical user-friendly program summary or brief, brief for wide distribution. The only thing I would add to that is first use the terms practical and user-friendly as watchwords in developing your proposal and serving your grantees. And second, present additional ideas and strategies other than confined populations. Additional ideas and strategies regarding confined populations who may be vulnerable and who must be protected and housed in the least restrictive and punitive uh, manner possible, as well as innovations for marketing, connecting and assisting subrecipient um, grantees, and reaching out to and serving the uh, cradle at large. Next slide. Program deliverables. The component of uh, the applicant, this component part uh, just discussed should be designed and written to result. Oh, I'm sorry. I've already covered that slide. I'm sorry. Can you go to the next slide? No worries. Okay. Program um, and the next slide, review criteria. Thank you. Uh, this slide shows you um, the weight that's given to the component parts of the application in addressing and assessing the application. The application reviewers will evaluate the factors below. In the description of the issue, they'll look for an understanding of the issue or problem being addressed. In the project design and implementation section, they will assess the strength of the proposal to include looking at your goals, objectives, timelines, and deliverables. In terms of capabilities and competencies, they'll look at an applicant's administrative and technical capacity to achieve the goals and objectives. In the plan for collecting data, they'll want to see a real clear understanding of the performance data and reporting requirements and a relatively detailed plan for collecting the, that data. In reviewing budgets, they're going to look for costs that are fully described, complete, effective, necessary, and allowable. And again, this is all available in the solicitation. So I think with that, I'll fumble my way back over to Tom. Perfect. That was great, Steve. Thank you so much. Um, so application um, resources, we're in the home stretch here, and then we'll, I see that there are already three questions in the Q&A, which is great. So um, some, um, some for, you know, someone put three questions already there, and they're excellent questions. So we'll get to those in just a minute. Um, but before we get to the Q&A portion, I want to quickly highlight just a few application resources and just, you know, full transparency with you all. We at BJA are, are of course, required to work in the Just Grant system. So DNI and our colleagues at BJA are keenly aware of the ongoing challenges associated with using Just Grants both from an internal and an external user's point of view. So um, any pain that you're experiencing related to Just Grants or have in the past, you know, we feel that as well and we're with you and we've tried to make um, as many resources available as possible to support work um, in Just Grants. And there are just two quick takeaways that I want to most convey here. And the first is that if you're having trouble with registering in grants.gov, which is the first step in the application process, or using just grants, there is help out here, out there for you. We are here to um, help, our colleagues are here to help you. And the second um, is that if you're planning to submit an application for funding under this exciting new program, and we very, very um, much hope that you are, Please start early and don't wait until the very last minute. Um, I'm a procrastinator, um, full disclosure at heart, so I totally understand the tendency to wait until the last minute to pull together an application to register in, in grants.gov and to submit an application in Just Grants. And I strongly encourage you all to set aside any and all procrastination tendencies that you may have. Um, and to start and finish early and to seek help and guidance um, if you need um, if you need it using uh, the resources that I'll run through briefly in this final section. So um, up on the slide right now, um, which is impossible to read given the um, tiny, tiny font, sorry about that, but I want to emphasize but the point here is that OJP has on its website a really helpful grant application resource guide. And this guide applies to both site-based grants and cooperative agreements. Again, a cooperative agreement is the focus of, um, of the funding available under this program that we're discussing today. 
Um, and I would, so I would encourage you to familiarize yourself with the OJP grant application resource guide. Um, the contents of the guide, and there are many, um, are listed in tiny print on the right side of the slide. But the nice thing about this guide is that you can click through it online um, and then download and print whatever sections you're most interested in. Or um, if you like paper, like Dee and I do, you can print out the whole thing and um, take it home with you. Um, one, one word of warning, it's not terribly exciting reading, but it does do a great job of walking readers through every step of OJPs. And BJA, since BJA again is under the OJ Pre umbrella um, application and funding process. So next slide, please. Um, I want to also draw your attention to the Just Grants website, which includes an overview of DOJ's grants and payment management systems. Uh, particularly, I think relevant to well everyone, but particularly relevant to um, applicants that may be relatively new and haven't submitted a lot or many um, applicants to applications to OJP or its components, including BJA. And the resources available here on the Just Grants website include virtual training. There are up-to-date and relevant FAQs. Um, there's user support immediately available if you have specific questions, um, other resources, and relevant news and updates. The next slide, please. In terms of the specifics of applications that are submitted under this new program, and as emphasized and reiterated in the solicitation, um, including on page five of the solicitation, all applicants must register for this funding opportunity in, in grants.gov and submit by the grants.gov deadline of June 13, 2024 at 8.59 p.m. Eastern Time, the required application for federal assistance standard form, which is known as the SF-424 form, and the required disclosure of lobby activities, which is known as the SF triple L or LLL form. Um, that's a lot of mumbo jumbo. I'm, I apologize, my apologies for that. But two step process, grants.gov is the first process and within, or first step. And uh, within grants.gov by June 13th of 2024 at um, 8.59 p.m. Eastern Time, um, applicants must submit again the SF 424 form and the SF LLL form. And again, all of this information is spelled out in the solicitation. And then after the grants.gov deadline, step two is the deadline for full applications in Just Grants, which is a week after the grants.gov deadline on June 20th of 2024 at 8.59 p.m. Eastern Time. On this slide and in the solicitation, I want to note that there's contact information for support and assistance related to both the grants.gov deadline on June 13th and the full application deadline in Just Grants on June 20th. Again, please don't wait until the last minute to meet these two deadlines, and please use the customer support hotlines and emails on the screen if you have questions or if you encounter difficulties with either deadline. Again, there's help available if you need it. Next, next slide, please. And then um, more broadly, to receive email updates um, from OJP about funding opportunities that may be of interest to you all, and to receive um, OJP's twice twice monthly newsletter information and updates related to Just Grants, please don't hesitate to text your email address to the number on the screen, uh, which is 468311. Again, 468311 uh, to subscribe. Just provide your email address um, uh, to us if you're so inclined. And even if you decide not to pursue funding under the new program that we're discussing today, we at OJP and BJ really want to be a part of your network, and so please consider texting us your email address so that we can stay in regular touch with you. Next slide, please. And then you can, of course, um, also stay connected to OJP and BJ via social media. BJA's Facebook, X, which is formerly Twitter, and YouTube information um, is on the screen, and you can use the QR code that we included uh, to, to subscribe to BJA's Justice Matters and News from BJA publications. So that, again, you can stay up to speed on BJA's work, as well as funding and training and technical assistance opportunities and new BJA resources that may be relevant to you. And of course, BJA's website can be accessed using the link on the screen and is also a great place to go for more information about our work. Next slide. And then I want to really emphasize the questions about 
the specific programmatic requirements related to the solicitation that we're talking about today must be sent to, to the OJP Response Center. Um, even if it's your inclination, please do not send questions um, about the solicitation to D or me. All questions that she and I receive must be sent then through the OJP Response Center so that responses to the questions can be provided to the broader field. This process exists to ensure that all potential applicants have the same access to responses to the questions that are submitted and to help ensure that the competitive process is fair and open. Again, please be in touch with the OJP Response Center and not D or me, although we love to hear from you, with questions about the programmatic requirements related to this new funding opportunity. The OJP Response Center will, as needed, consult with D and me before issuing responses to the questions they receive. Next slide, please. And then finally, as we close up here and uh, pivot to questions, I just want to reemphasize that there are two or dual deadlines related to this new solicitation. Again, the first um, deadline is on June 13th of uh, 2024 at 8.59 p.m. Eastern Time when all applicants must submit the SF-424 and the SF-LLL form in grants.gov. And the second deadline, step two, is June 20th of 2024 at 8.59 p.m. Eastern Time when full applications, including all the attachments that are required and described in the solicitation, must be submitted in Just Grants. And again, please note that both solicitation deadline times are 8.59 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, please also read the uh, review and um, the solicitation carefully for further guidance about these two deadlines and what's required to be submitted for each of them. And finally, next slide, here's a summary of the important contacts that I just went through for grants.gov, for Just Grants, and for questions related to the programmatic requirements in the vulnerable population solicitation that we're discussing. I want to emphasize again that first and foremost, there's help out there if you need it. Please don't hesitate to use the contact information on this slide uh, to ask for assistance. And second, if you're going to apply for funding under this solicitation, and we hope that you are, please start early and leave yourself sufficient time in case you encounter questions related to any of these steps, the grants.gov steps, the just grants steps, or the specific requirements defined in the solicitation. Um, you still have plenty of time to apply for funding under this solicitation, and Dee and I sincerely hope that we receive many high-quality, comprehensive applications that respond fully to the requirements defined in the solicitation and that we discussed today. Um, to reiterate, D and I, like BJ Director Moore and OJP AAG Solomon, are very excited about this new program, and we have high expectations that it will result in innovative and effective work in agencies across the country to enhance the safety of vulnerable people behind the walls. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of Dee as well, and on behalf of Daryl, I want to thank you for your interest in this new program and for taking time out of your very busy schedules to be with us today. Um, we'll now um, pivot to questions, um, and I see, um, just to um, go there right now, again, please use the Q&A function um, that can be accessed via the three little dots in the lower right-hand um, corner of your screens to ask, uh, to ask questions in the Q&A function. And I see three questions there right now. And while Dee was speaking, and they're good ones, I jotted down a few notes about them. So what I'd like to do is just to read, I'll read each question, and then I'll provide a response in turn to Dee in case she has anything to um, add. And so the first question is, is there a time frame for when we may expect the microgrants components of this opportunity to be announced for solicitation slash funding? And I think Dee and I, this question was submitted at 108, so just at the beginning of our remarks, and I hope that we answered it. But um, but let me just go over it again. So the selected, the way that we structured this program is that the competitively selected cooperative agreement recipient um, will administer the micro grant program um, under the direction of us at BJA and in collaboration with us from start to finish. So it's actually the cooperative agreement recipient that we select who will, in coordination with us at BJA, um, announce the micro grant program 
market it, review, receive and review applications, and then make recommendations for funding to BJA. So the microgrant work is not going to come via a solicitation from BJA. It will come um, from the cooperative agreement recipient that is selected, and um, we anticipate that that cooperative agreement recipient that we select um, will come up with um, a small and succinct package of materials or a document that describes the microgrant opportunity and what agencies can do to apply for funding under that opportunity. Dee, anything to add? Um, the award date is September. Yeah, we anticipate making awards um, under this cooperative agreement um, by the end of the fiscal year. So by um, the October or December. So the fiscal year ends on September um, 30th. And so on or around October 1st, or maybe a little bit before that, we anticipate that the award for this cooperative agreement will be made. And so I would just add that um, just remember that the cooperative agreement recipient will still have to stand up that program like yep. I sp spoke about, and that's going to be um, designing the program, working with BJA. So they'll have to put together announcements, informational materials, an application, put together an application process, announce that process, um, and allow time for those applications to come in. So it'll, it'll be a little while after um, October 1st, but not too long because we want to get this, this uh, project moving for sure. Yep. And D, a perfect segue, D, I think you actually responded to the next question, which is what will the process look like for the microgrant solicitation? And as you just said, you used the word process, D, we, we encourage applicate, um, applicants under this opportunity, cooperative agreement applicants, to explain and describe to us what that microgrant um, application process and solicitation or request for proposals will look like. And so we really want to hear from applicants about how you all, how they applicants would set up a, um, a micro grant program, market it, what kinds of materials would be developed, and um, what the overarching process will look like. And I think it's key to remember here, and if you haven't done this kind of a project before, it's going to be really critically important to stay connected to those subrecipients. Um, some, some may be large agencies who are used to grants and, and federal monies. Others just may not be, and they may need a little bit more guidance and a little bit more help. And it's going to be incumbent on the cooperative agreement recipient to provide that guidance. And so that's going to mean probably several phone calls back and forth and being available for questions from those subrecipients and maybe even developing additional materials for everyone that gets awarded. Um, thanks, Dee. Um, and then the next question, related question, can a microgrant solicitor slash applicant be a health center or FQHC or must they operate a confinement facility? And so the way that this is structured is that applicants for microgrants must be state, local, or tribal agencies, uh, public agencies that operate adult confinement facilities. However, um, they, the microgrant applicants or recipients, may partner with other agencies and organizations. One of the examples I provided as an innovation that could be supported under the microgrant program is to partner with um, local or state-based um, victim advocacy rate crisis organizations. Um, those um, um, it may not be a public organization, they're not organizations that confine individuals, but certainly under the microgram program or process, um, an agency that confines individuals may want to partner with um, such an organization. So um, microgram recipients, applicants, again, need to be state, local, or tribal agencies that operate um, adult confinement facilities, but they can partner with others. Anything to add to that, Dave? No, I would just I would just reiterate that, and as cooperative agreement uh, applicants, make sure you build that partnership, the ability to partner with others into your project plan. Yep, and D, you you have um, once again segued beautifully to the next question. Um, can we apply as 
partnership uh, between different organizations. For example, one to manage the administrative process of microgrants and one who brings the substantive topic expertise. And the answer is yes, absolutely. There's information about this in the solicitation, so please review the solicitation. And I guess the one thing that I would add to that is um, that there needs to be one organization um, that is the lead, and then um, others can be subrecipients or subawardees under the lead applicant. So have to have one applicant that meets the eligibility criteria that be reviewed, and then um, there can be additional partners brought on. And one way to think about it is reflected in this question where one manages the administrative process of the microgrants and one brings the subject matter or substantive topic expertise. That's one of many ways to think about how to um, organize an application with, that includes partners. Let me just scroll down here. Um, okay, next question. A nonprofit that specializes in working with a specific vulnerable population, like severe mental illness, um, be competitive if they have a plan for equitably reviewing micro-grant submissions that serve vulnerable populations outside of the nonprofit's specialization. I'm not, um, I think that I would refer this question back to the solicitation. One, I would review the, um, the eligibility criteria, nonprofit, um, here, and would they be competitive if they have a plan for equitably reviewing microgrant submissions that serve vulnerable populations outside of the nonprofit's specialization? I'm just thinking about this. Um, I, um, I think that um, I can't comment on um, kind of how competitive um, an applicant would necessarily be given one issue or another, but I think equitably reviewing microgrant submissions, um, equitably and objectively reviewing um, microgrant submissions or applications is certainly a key part of what we expect and what's defined in the solicitation um, related to um, the overall management of the microgrant process. And, and don't forget, you can also, um, you know, specialty organizations can certainly sign on as partners with the cooperative agreement recipient. Right. And yeah, referring back to the prior question, um, there may be organizations that bring pieces of this work, you know, like expertise within a particularly vulnerable population, um, but but maybe not expertise in the management and administration of micro grants. And so I think this this solicitation offers fertile ground and lots of opportunity for unique partnerships um, related to administration of smaller awards and then expertise related to protecting vulnerable people. I would almost expect to see the variety of expertise just because there's a variety of vulnerable populations and right. their needs are different. Yep, and depending on how broad or how narrow an applicant wants to focus in on a vulnerable population of one kind or multiple kinds, again, all of that is permitted under the solicitation. Um, as Dee and I were preparing for this yesterday, we really, you know, um, one kind of phrase that came to mind to us was we really want you all to tell us how you want to approach work related to one or more vulnerable populations as, we, as we've defined broadly in the solicitation. Um, Let's see, one more question to be clear. This process only applies to NGO state college who wish to create and distribute the subgrants. If so, how would those interested in the subgrant process know of where or how to apply when that process begins? Um, so, so you reviewed the eligibility criteria and um, for applicants under this cooperative agreement opportunity. And then those we at BJA would expect that cooperative agreement recipient to come up with a, and to carry out a robust marketing, um, marketing plan to educate um, agencies and facilities across the country that house um, adults um, about the opportunity to apply for micro grants. Um, to address issues related to protecting vulnerable people. So, um, which is why in, in the solicitation, and Dee may have mentioned that um, we expect that organizations that apply for this opportunity to receive this cooperative agreement will have um, experience um, 
addressing issues related to protecting vulnerable people and experience delivering um, training and technical assistance and supporting um, site-based work on criminal justice issues across the country. Our recipients, um, recipients, sub-recipients prohibited from providing TTA using funds from the micro grants themselves, i.e., can a micro grant recipient use some of the micro grant to pay for additional TTA from a grant recipient or sub recipient? And that's a good question, and it's one that we receive and consistent with um, our current practice. Um, sort of look at that as um, potentially like double dipping, for lack of a better way of describing it. And so, um, I'm so no, I don't. Um, this is consistent with how we at BJA have delivered TTA in the past. And so the, um, the cooperative agreement recipient that is selected is going to issue competitive micro grants in consultation with BJA to state, local, and tribal agencies. Um, and those micro grants can support um, training and technical assistance. Um, you know, for example, training staff about X, Y, or Z, but that training or technical assistance cannot be provided by the original cooperative agreement recipient. So that money can't then get sloshed back to the cooperative agreement recipient after it's been awarded to the subgrantee to pay for additional services. So I think that answers the question. This is an issue that's come up before, and the um, and the the rules remain the same per guidance that we've gotten from our general counsel's office. And um, so the person who asked that question, if that's not clear, would encourage you to um, resend it to the OJP Response Center, and we can issue a written response um, that is clearer than what I've provided. But I think, again, the question was, are recipients or subrecipients prohibited from providing TTA using the funds from the microgrants themselves, i.e., can a microgrant recipient use some of the microgrants to pay for additional TTA from a grant recipient or subrecipient? And the answer is no. Um, how, next question, how should, how should we incorporate potential supplemental funding into a program plan? Can we reference what we would do with supplemental funds and would supplemental funding be used to extend the project or could it be used to augment the program activities during the four year period? Um, we don't know for sure if supplemental funding will be available, um, certainly, for programs like this, there is precedent at BJA for providing supplemental funding that is um, 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 assuming that it's available and assuming that the cooperative agreement uh, recipient meets or exceeds the expectations that we've defined in the solicitation. Um, and I would, um, my, my guidance to applicants would be um, that you do the best you can to define how you would use the available funding over the 48-month period and articulate um, in the solicitation um, what you might do if there was supplemental funding um, available. But since it's not available, um, you know, I, I can't, we're, we're not in a position to say, yes, it's available, please let us know how it would be used because it's not currently available, and if it were to be available, fingers crossed, we don't know how much that supplemental funding would be. So. And the timing, so they do it, what, during 48 months? The 40, uh, Dean and I are having a sidebar here. Sorry. So, the, so yeah, 40, so I would say um, articulate how, how you would best use the funding over the 48 month okay. project period and when, right, and if there are, yes, and, um, and, um, highlight, if you are so inclined, um, the need for potentially supplemental funding and um, explain kind of what that would look like. But again, I can't make any commitments now about the availability of supplemental funding. We hope this goes as, um, as well as we um, um, have defined in the solicitation. We hope it goes consistent with the solicitation and that there will be supplemental funding available. So 
that's, and sorry, I can't be more clear and more definitive about supplemental funding here, but um, um, again, do the best you can to define how the resources that are available will be deployed over the 48 month period and when, and um, highlight the need for um, supplemental funding if you're so inclined to do so, if you reach the conclusion that supplemental funding is needed to fully carry out the goals and objectives um, defined in the solicitation. Um, question here is interest in workforce development program. Um, I'm not sure what exactly that's referring to, but if there's a connection between um, a workforce development program and vulnerable people who are confined, um, then certainly, yes. And I think overall, uh, BJA has um, significant interest in workforce development programs as a, you know, viable component of you know, reentry beyond this program. So the nexus here is protecting vulnerable people. And so if there is a nexus between a workforce development program and um, protecting vulnerable people, then um, it may be relevant um, in the context of an application under this solicitation. Um, grant duration, 48 months is the grant duration. And as we discussed earlier and just a moment ago, um, you know, uh, pending the availability of appropriations and um, ongoing commitment on the part of BJA, OJP, and DOJ to protecting vulnerable people behind the walls. Um, I would hope that there would be supplemental funding um, available in future fiscal years. Um, can county governments um, that run an adult detention center apply? And there are lots and lots of uh, BJA programs that county governments that run adult detention centers can apply for. Um, as Dee mentioned, the eligibility requirements here um, preclude um, county governments from applying for funding under this solicitation. And thank you, Daryl. Daryl just uh, popped up the eligible applicants. Um, now, with that, a county government that runs an adult detention center can absolutely apply for a micro grant under this program. And so that's the connection. And so I would encourage the person who asked this good question to keep an eye out, stay in touch with us at BJA, um, and we can um, let this let you know um, when the micro grant program to be supported under this um, under this solicitation becomes available and a county government that runs an adult detention center can absolutely apply uh, for a micro grant. In fact, that's, that's really the kind of um, almost a perfect, almost a perfect applicant in a way for a micro grant because a lot of times if you get a grant from the government and it's like $100,000 or $250,000, that's a lot of money to spend well. Um, and yeah, that, that's what these micro grants are targeted to do. Just find, have a problem that's relatively narrow, doesn't take a lot of effort, but it, it does take a plan. It does take people coaching you and getting you through it. And this is exactly what we're trying to do. It doesn't have to be a big, you know, production. It can be a small problem with a small solution. Thanks, Steve. Um, and we're a little bit over, apologies. Um, if you have to drop off, please do that. I will, I see one more um, question and then we'll, we'll end it there. To follow up, um, would a nonprofit only be eligible um, if they specialize in a broad range of vulnerable populations or would a nonprofit with specialization in a specific vulnerable population be eligible if they have uh, the other administrative expertise? Um, nonprofits, uh, as Dee mentioned, are eligible to apply. And so um, that I want to just re reiterate for sure. And then beyond that, I would um, encourage potential applicants who are part of nonprofits to review the, um, the solicitation and determine if your nonprofit is well positioned and equipped to apply either as um, the primary applicant or as a partner under um, a solicitation with more than one applicant. And is that 250K annually for four years or 250K for the entire four years? Um, that's a really good question. Um, we would encourage, so there's 200, there's $2.5 million available for this cooperative agreement. Um, and it's a four year um, project with the possibility of supplemental funding in future fiscal years. 
um, we would ask applicants to explain and describe how they will, um, how they would propose to best and most effectively utilize the resources available during that 48 month project period. And remembering the amount that has to go to the micro grant grant. Correct. 50% or at least 50%. So 1.75 million has to go um, out the door in the form of micro grants to state, local, and tribal agencies that are working to um, increase the safety of vulnerable people behind the walls. And with that, I think we're going to end it there. I think I've answered, we've answered all the questions that have come in the Q&A. For those remaining, sorry to go over time a few minutes, but figured we would just take the opportunity to try to answer all the questions. Again, thank you so much for your time and attention, and we look forward to reviewing many um, high-quality, comprehensive applications under this exciting new program. Thanks so much. Have a good day, and um, enjoy your, your upcoming weekend. And for reference, the PowerPoint transcript and recording for today's webinar will be posted to BJ's website. So everybody that registered today will be receiving an email when and where to access that. So on behalf of the Bureau of Justice Assistance and our panelists, we want to thank you for joining today's webinar. This will end today's presentation.